Now there's a few different data networks. The first one is a local area network. It's called a LAN. Now some people confuse this with large area network. It really is local area network. And a local area network is simply more than one computer connected to each other. Now this in itself presented some challenges for the early founders of data networks because they had things where information from multiple computers would not simply be traveled in certain directions. So they had to think of things like creating a thing called a switch, a router, and other technical devices that would allow the information to travel between more than one computer. The first part I want to explain about data networks on a local area network is something to do with data collision. Now, if you think of a car collision, that's when two cars, unfortunately, come together and stop and they're traveling in different directions. A data collision is exactly the same, except with computers, where data contacts each other and stops. It can't be sent to another computer. Now, this is a problem because obviously the other computer, the information you're waiting on, the image, the video file, your banking details, they can't actually get to that computer in the first place. So someone created this idea and they were from Xerox and they found this way in which through a special cable called an ethernet cable, which you would have heard about, the ethernet cable allows data to transfer between different computers at different time intervals. These relatively small networks of closed by computers are called local area networks or LANs. A LAN could be as small as two machines in the same room or as large as a university campus with thousands of computers. Although many LAN technologies were developed and deployed, the most famous and successful was Ethernet, developed in the early 1970s at Xerox PARC and still widely used today. In its simplest form, a series of computers are connected to a single common Ethernet cable. When a computer wants to transmit data to another computer, it writes the data as an electrical signal onto the cable. Of course, because the cable is shared, every computer plugged into the network sees the transmission, but doesn't know if the data is intended for them or another computer. To solve this problem, Ethernet requires that each computer has a unique media access control address, or MAC address. The unique address is put into a header that prefixes any data sent over the network. So computers simply listen to the Ethernet cable and only process data when they see their address in the header. This works really well. Every computer made today comes with its own unique MAC address for both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. The general term for this approach is Carrier Sense Multiple Access, or CSMA for short. The carrier in this case is any shared transmission medium that carries data, copper wire in the case of Ethernet, and the air carrying radio waves for Wi-Fi. Many computers can simultaneously sense the carrier, hence the sense and multiple access, and the rate at which the carrier can transmit data is called its bandwidth. Unfortunately, using a shared carrier has one big drawback. When network traffic is light, computers can simply wait for silence on the carrier and then transmit their data. But as network traffic increases, the probability that two computers will attempt to write data at the same time also increases. This is called a collision, and the data gets all garbled up, like two people trying to talk on the phone at the same time. Fortunately, computers can detect these collisions by listening to the signal on the wire. The most obvious solution is for computers to stop transmitting, wait for silence, and then try again. Problem is, the other computer is going to try that too, and other computers on the network that have been waiting for the carrier to go silent will try to jump in during any pause. This just leads to more and more collisions. Ethernet had a surprisingly simple and effective fix. When transmitting computers detect a collision, they wait for a brief period before attempting to retransmit. As an example, let's say one second. Of course, this doesn't work if all the computers use the same wait duration. They just collide again one second later. So a random period is added. One computer might wait 1.3 seconds, while another waits 1.5 seconds. With any luck, the computer that waited 1.3 seconds will wake up, find the carrier to be silent, and start transmitting. When the 1.5 second computer wakes up a moment later, it will see the carrier is in use, and will wait for the other computer to finish. So an extra trick is used. 
As I just explained, if a computer detects a collision while transmitting, it will wait one second, plus some random extra time. However, if it collides again, which suggests network congestion, instead of waiting another one second, this time it will wait two seconds. If it collides again, it will wait four seconds, and then eight, and then 16, and so on, until it's successful. With computers backing off, the rate of collision goes down, and data starts moving again, freeing up the network. Family dinner saved. This backing off behavior using an exponentially growing wait time is called exponential back off. Both Ethernet and Wi-Fi use it, and so do many transmission protocols. To reduce collisions and improve efficiency, we need to shrink the number of devices on any given shared carrier, what's called the collision domain. To reduce the likelihood of collisions, we can break this network into two collision domains by using a network switch. It sits between our two smaller networks and only passes data between them if necessary. It does this by keeping a list of what MAC addresses are on what side of the network. So if A wants to transmit to C, the switch doesn't forward the data to the other network. There's no need. This means if E wants to transmit to F at the same time, the network is wide open and two transmissions can happen at once. But if F wants to send data to A, then the switch passes it through and the two networks are both briefly occupied. This is essentially how big computer networks are constructed, including the biggest one of all, the internet, which literally interconnects a bunch of smaller networks, allowing inter-network communication. What's interesting about these big networks is that there's often multiple paths to get data from one location to another. And this brings us to another fundamental networking topic, routing. Instead of a dedicated route from A to B, messages are passed through several stops. So if John writes a letter to Hank, it might go from Indianapolis to Chicago, and then hop to Minneapolis, then Billings, and then finally make it to Missoula. Each stop knows where to send it next, because they keep a table of where to pass letters given a destination address. What's neat about message switching is that they can use different routes, making communication more reliable and fault tolerant. Sticking with our mail example, if there's a blizzard in Minneapolis grinding things to a halt, the Chicago Mail Hub can decide to route the letter through Omaha instead. In our example, cities are acting like network routers. The number of hops a message takes along its route is called the hop count. Keeping track of the hop count is useful because it can help identify routing problems. A downside to message switching is that messages are sometimes big, so they can clog up the network because the whole message has to be transmitted from one stop to the next before continuing on its way. While a big file is transferring, that whole link is tied up. Even if you have a tiny one kilobyte email trying to get through, it either has to wait for the big file transfer to finish or take a less efficient route. That's bad. 